There we go. Who's ready to do this? Any Amberell fans in the audience? Worst cooks? Yeah? All right, we're going to get Ann right out here. My name is Devin Padgett. I'm producer of Special Projects for Food and Wine. And this is our favorite time of year. Hope you, if you've had a good time at the Classic so far, let me hear you holler. Okay, we got to practice that holler because as soon as we bring Ann out here, what we have to do here is we're going to be a mighty, 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 mighty crew here with our voice and our volume. We want to blow them away over there. So when I say Ann Burrell here in just a second, you guys are going to get as loud as you possibly can. Cool? And we're going to extend it for like four or five seconds, like a, one of those long ones, right? Like, like, like Madonna came out or, or, or Lady Gaga or the Rolling Stones or somebody like that because Ann is all of that and more. She is the, she is the epitome of rock star chef. She's a, an author. She's a, a restaurateur. She is a TV personality. You guys know her from everywhere. She is super cool. Anybody in here have a, the Ann Burrell hair? I'm looking, I'm looking out there, and I don't, but... Yeah, checking it out. Um, we love Ann. This is her third time. I thought it was longer, but this is her third time with us in Aspen. We hope she'll, she'll keep coming back year after year after year. She puts on the greatest show ever. So you guys ready to do this? Yeah. All right. Let's give a warm Aspen welcome to the one and only Ann Burrell. Yeah. Ann Burrell. Ann Burrell. Woo. It's so good to be here. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a cloudy and chilly Saturday afternoon. Let's get things heated up. What do you think? Right? All right. So, um, you know, I always start off my demo. For those, anyone who's, who's seen me demo before, um, welcome back. Anyone who is new, yay. We're going to have some fun together. So we're going to cook a little bit, um, but also just understand this is our time together. <laughs> so, you know, I very much encourage audience participation. You want to heckle me? Great. I welcome in. <laughs> Bring it on. But just remember, that goes both ways, my friends. <laughs> so, um, all right, excuse me. Hang on one second. My glass just does not look full enough. That is not an Amber Al pour. So, I'm, <laughs> I'm drinking Prosecco, cheap and cheerful, much like me. Um, it's... <laughs> It's a sparkling white wine from the Veneto, the northeastern part of Italy. I drink it on the rocks. Why? Because I like it that way. <laughs> you have a problem with that? Don't drink my wine. Get your own. Um, and in fact, just do that anyway. So um, we're going to talk some food. Yes, always my favorite subject. But it's also, if you have questions about what I'm making today or something I've made in the past or just in general, um, you know, great. I love it. You know, be involved because, as I said, this is our time together. Um, so, but I could probably knock a few questions out of the box right away. It's just hairspray. <laughs> yes, the people on Words Cooked really are that bad. <laughs> we don't have to fake it. And um, no, I am not in any way related to Guy Fieri. <laughs> so, all right. Hmm, there we go. Does that set the tone for today? Chin chin again, Aspen. <laughs> I hope everyone has a cocktail, and no, you can't have any of my Prosecco. <laughs> All right, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about braising. I mean, honestly, braising, I will have to say, is one of my very, if not one of my, sorry, this is just not sticking on me. Um, braising, I will have to say, I'm going to jump out there and say, is my favorite cooking technique. Why? Because it takes the lesser cuts of whatever it is, the lesser, the, the ones that are like, eh, I don't know what to do with that, so I'm just going to spend more money and buy a steak or, or something like that, that, you know, like anybody can cook a steak or a chicken breast or something like, you can cook it, sure, it might, you know, it's not, it might not be great, but you've cooked it. Um, braising is something much, much different than that, and it's, to me, 
It's where the soul in cooking lies. It is where you take like the crappy trash cuts of meat. Like honestly, to me, these days there aren't any more of those left. Like we need like different shaped cows or something or like animals <laughs> that have different cuts of meat that we can work on. But, um, you know, like you think about like the tough stuff that you could never just throw on a grill or in a saute pan and eat enjoyably. So it's taking something that is sort of like the underdog. I mean, I like to think of myself as kind of the underdog too. Um, and turning it into something, wow, why did that just make me emotional? I've just come, I've just come, <laughs> I've just come from like, a, like an interesting morning talking about all kinds of stuff that's going on in the industry lately and maybe it's if affecting me far more than I know, but um, let's, <laughs> But I love all of you guys, and it's really this audience participation, and to, to be able to talk about my passion in food is why I keep on doing what I do, and it's like why I keep coming to places like this. And when people come up to me and say like, oh, you've helped my family eat better, you helped get me through chemotherapy, or it's like your show is the only show that my kids and I can agree on, you know, like that to me. <laughs> I'm like, I just, like, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, good God. Um, right. But, but, you know, then I understand, like, what I do is not just talking about food. It's a responsibility. Um, and I love it so very much what I do. And, and this weekend, I have to say, has been really a magical weekend for me. So thank all of you guys. So, like... <laughs> When you have, you know, it's like, what is, what do you do when you have food? You get together or you, you know, when you have family meetings or, you know, gatherings or anything or a date or whatever, you get together and you either, you partake in something, whether it's booze, booze or, uh, or you get together, you know, weddings, funerals, you get together and you eat. So today we're going to get together and we're going to cook and I'm going to drink. Uh, so, but let's talk about braising. So braising. It is low and slow, my friends. It is like, take your time. Um, and I mean, when I first started, when I was in culinary school, and, and we were going through learning like all the, the cooking techniques and talking about like, braising or whatever, and I was like, ah, I want saute, because that's like badass. I want to work saute in a restaurant. I want to get on the line, like fire. Ah, ah. And like braising, I just didn't get it. I'm like, oh, God. It takes so long to get started, and then I don't, you're like, what? It's forever, hours and hours, and then what do you have us do? <laughs> and I'm like, all right, well, you know, like the more you go along, like the more you're like, realize like, oh my God, I didn't even know what I didn't even know and how much I didn't know. So, but when we talk about braising and things like that, it is coaxing the most flavor and making beautiful things out of things that were just, you know, previously thought of like, not fantastic things. So, I'm sure, really? I mean, this is gonna be the bane of my existence today. How about right here? Um, so, you know, hi, I'm Amber Allen, and I'm inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> nothing anyone hasn't ever heard before. So, but when we talk about like braising, and it's like, so my first thing always, when I think of the word, or when I think of the cooking tech braising, the first thing that pops into my mind is, Brown food tastes good. So, I mean, brown food. I like to say, when we're starting a braise, you have to take things to what I call the burnt toast phase. This is like the kookiness that happens inside my brain. Stick with me here for a minute, people. So, so we think about bread. Bread, you know, slice of bread. It's great. Sure, we love bread. Make sandwich, whatever. We like toast. Toast is good. A little crunchy, a little darker, a little light brown. You're like, hmm, more texture. Little brown, more flavor. Toast is the most flavorful one step before is garbage. So it's a true story. It's like one step before, one phase before is charcoal, before it's burned. It is the crunchiest, it's the most flavorful. So when I think about braising, I'm like, all right, like when we get a braise started, we take things to the burnt toast phase. We take them to the edge of disaster and then we yank it back. And that is where you get the most soulful, the most flavorful food that you can. So, all right, so I've got my, my pan here. I, so today, for this point, I'm braising chicken thighs. I am a chicken lover. Um, and chicken thighs, I mean, let's think about what cut of meat this is. I mean, like, plus, like, with this, uh, thunder thighs. Right? You know, it's like, go with what you know. Um, so, 
So we brown the crap out of our chicken thighs. And I think about this, and every time I say brown the crap out of it till you get crud, I think about when I first started on the Food Network, I started with a show called Secrets of a Restaurant Chef. And I miss that show a lot. It was like, it was one of my favorites to do, actually. But so the first show I ever did was a bolognese, like a, 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 like a meat sauce. And so I was like, brown the crap out of it till you get crud. And I was like, oh my God, my first show, my first five minutes on the Food Network ever, and that's what I said. I was like, really? Oh my God. Um, but so still to this day though, it's like the number one recipe that people come up to me and say, I make your bolognese and my family tells me I'm a rock star. Yes, that's why I do what I do, to, because I feel such supreme joy out of providing for other people and you know, like having them eat my food. Like I get much more enjoyment from watching people eat my food than me actually eating my own food. It's like I say comedians work for the laughs, chefs work for the head bob. Like we watch people take a bite and they're like, <laughs> and it's like, if you don't get that, you're like, oh shit, it's not, oh sorry, oh shoot, it's not. like, and then you go back and you taste it, and you're like, all right, maybe they're just not a head bobble person, maybe they're not a bobble head, I don't know, but so, um, we're getting our chicken thighs brown, now chicken thighs, we think about animals, all right, hang on, I have to come around here for a second, when we talk about braising, we think about the extremities, right, arm, arm, uh, arms, legs, all of this stuff. So when we think about animals, they walk around like this, right? So their arms, their legs, like this. This is where the tough cuts of meat are, here. Here, their core is the loosey-goosey. It's the big money items because those are the steaks, the chops, the ribeyes, whatever, that you can just throw on the grill, cook it, and they're good. That's also why they cost more. Oh, right, there's the rub. So when you have Bossy the cow walking around like this, she has a tough shoulder, she has her shanks, she has her round, her round. Um, I mean, that's what it's called, <laughs> the cut of her. her. Um, but so these are all the very tough cuts of meat. Uh, and you think about what do you want to do with them. I mean, when you think about ground meat, ground chuck is the shoulder. I would buy ground chuck all the time for burgers and stuff. Very flavorful, very tough, but if you're going to grind it, who the heck cares if it's tough, right? Oh, save yourself a little money there. So, but when we braise stuff, we think tough cuts of meat that need to be cooked low and slow. <clears throat> it's not about medium rare, rare whatever, well done. It is so far past all of that, that, sorry, hang on one second. This altitude is getting to me. My emotions and excited and all of you people. Any questions right this second? <laughs> Wait, hang on, this will help. <laughs> So it's like you think about when you start off, even if you cook a steak, you have a steak that's rare and you poke it, right? Squishy. You have a steak that's well done, what's it like? Your shoe. Um, so it's just hard. So when protein cooks, the more you cook it, what does it do? It firms up, firms up, firms up. Braising is like, it's like a testament of wills. <laughs> I'm like, I'm bigger than you, Thunder Thigh, I'm gonna win. So it's like you cook it low and slow, you put it in a jacuzzi, what do you do when you get in a jacuzzi? You're like, oh, oh wait, I'm going to relax. So it's so far past cooking anything to temperature that it's like the proteins have done this, and then they give up, and they're like, ugh. And then everything is so flavorful and delicious, and you're like, yeah, this is why I love a short rib. This is why I love a braised lamb shank. This is why I love an osso because it is what you do as your skill as a cook to make something magical out of something that was originally like, oh, you know, leave that for the help. Because that's, what's our, that's what the cooks are. So um, I'm putting my chicken thighs in. So chicken thighs, I mean, chicken is tender, but the thighs, more fat in them and a little bit tougher. So that's why they can stand up to a braise. I mean, to me, the perfect thing to braise ever is a chicken thigh because you can do it pretty fast and it's not super tough in the first part and lots of flavor with a little bone in there. I mean, that makes me very happy. Dark meat with a little bone in there that I can pick it up and eat it off. Yeah. So, all right, so I have my, my chicken browning, and we're gonna brown the crap out of it. Like, if you are doing it, hi. I need it, I need it, sir. Thank you for coming, though. <laughs> um, 
Right, now you made me forget where I was. Um, <laughs> did it just get hot in here? Uh, <laughs> So we brown the crap out of it till we get crap. No, that's not where I was. Like, hang on, fast forward a little bit. We're browning our chicken thighs. Now, if you are, like, whether it's chicken thighs or a lamb shank or stew meat, whatever you're making, brown it, brown it. And if you have to ask yourself, is that brown, then it's not, <laughs> right? If you have to say, hmm, is that brown, then no, it's not brown. <laughs> I mean, always say with cooking, too, I would say this. I am the low-tech solution kind of girl. You know, I'm always about like, uh, okay, is it brown? Uh, yes, no, all right, then it's not brown. Or like always about the low-tech solution. Don't make it any more difficult than it needs to be. So we've got chicken thighs browning. Then I'm going to take them out, and I'm going to sweat some onions. So while this is happening, I'm going to start to dice my onions. Let's talk about onion cutting, cuttery. What temperature is my burner at? Hi. <laughs> it's been to like, you know, Silver Peak. <laughs> I can say that because it's legal here. <laughs> um, so the thing is also, like, people are like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I'm scared I'm going to burn it. Well, you know what? The, the, the knobs on the burners uh, adjust. So. Again, the low-tech solution. So, I, like, really, I say this stuff and I laugh in jest and that kind of stuff, but it's, it's stuff that we're always, like, all of us, at our, our stove, at our house, like, being like, I don't know, I don't know, is it brown? Is my, is my pan burning? Is it, like, is it too hot? If you see your pan starting to smoke and get away from you, turn your burner down. Hi. Hi. Can you stand up and yell? Because I can't hear you. I'm just browning the outside. It's just right now, I'm looking for the color. That's it. Um, because then we're going to do low and slow in liquid. So while my chicken thighs are browning, let's talk about cutting an onion. I mean, like an onion, like I also say who I am as a cook is like I'm the grocery store ingredient kind of girl. Like, you know, what can I do with stuff and how can I make stuff magical that I can find at my regular grocery store? Yes, there are always our super secret flavor weapons that we have to go to specialty stores and find somewhere else, somewhere else, whatever. But what can I do to make grocery store ingredients special? And that's where my creativity as a cook comes in. Um, and then also my cooking technique. Yeah? But you guys can have that too at your house. Like, yes, let's have an applause for all of that. Yeah! All right. But then, you know, at the beginning and the end of the day, uh, food should taste good. <laughs> right? People are like, huh? Food should taste good. <laughs> if it doesn't, there's something wrong, right? Oh, I was like, why? Is, I would expect that would have gotten a rambunctious applause. Like, everyone's like, oh, huh. What? Food's supposed to taste good? Yes. Newsflash, everybody. Food should taste good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, wow, that was tough getting to that one. All right. So let's first of all talk about our onion and how to hold our knife. I mean, anyone who's seen Worst Cooks, we know the red finger situation. All right. So this is how we hold our knife. We take it, we pinch it between our thumb and forefinger, and we drop the other three fingers downtown and we get a firm control on this. A lot of times people think that they should just shake hands with their knife. No, you're not in control of this. This is like the equivalent of the dish towel handshake. You know, when someone comes up and they're like, oh, God. And you're like, oh, OK. Oh. So, or a lot of times what people feel like they need to do when they're really stable is put their finger out like this. No. So if you pinch it between the thumb and forefinger and drop your three fingers down, you are in control of this and think of it as an extension of your arm or your hand, if you will. But this is going to feel weird for your hand. We know that. <laughs> Accept it and move on. <laughs> I mean, everything, everything when it's new feels weird now, doesn't it? <laughs> Same. All right. So we've got an onion. An onion, like most things, has two ends. It has the stem end that grows up towards the sky, and it has the root end that we call the hairy end. So when you're thinking about cutting an onion, think leave the hairy end on. 
You'll see why in a second. But so when it's, hang on, let me just check my chicken. All right, let me say. Thank you. Not brown yet, people. All right, that is a lovely shade of golden. All right, so I'm gonna cut this stem end off my onion. I don't like to chase my onion or anything rolly around my cutting board with my big knife when my fingers are there. So let's just do the low tech situation and stabilize the issue. So I cut this stem end off and look at that. No more rolly. <laughs> Oh, hey, um, can I get anyone a cup of coffee? <laughs> like, so we cut it in half right through the middle, right through the hairy end. And then look, I have a little corner in which to, I like to take the first layer off the onion as well. I mean, a lot of times it's dry, it's damaged, it's not beautiful. And I don't like to eat food that's not beautiful. So thank you for coming. Um, and I have a little corner in which to do, to do it and to be a super speed demon. So then when I think about dicing an onion, I mean, knife cuts, people, like when you are cooking, whether you are a professional chef or whether you're a home cook, knife cuts are important. Uniformity in the kitchen and knife cuts are like cooking things. First of all, they're pretty. We like pretty things, but they will cook uniformly. So I'm gonna take the tip of my knife. I'm going to slice my onion. I'm going to cut through the back, but not to the back. No cutty offy. and you'll see why. Ready, here we go. Oops, out of cutty office. Um, <laughs> so, but look what I have. So, this, the hairy end holds my onion together. But look, it's cut, but it's together, but it's cut. This is what the hairy end does. It holds everybody together. If you cut the hairy end off and leave the stem end on, it will not behave this way. So, and then all my slices were the same size. Why? Size does matter. We're looking for uniformity. All right, there we go. Then one time through the middle, and then we just go downtown like this. And then we get here, and I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh, it's tall, it's chippy, my fingers, I'm a little nervous. What do I do, throw it away? No way, I bought the whole onion, let's use the whole onion. So just tip it forward. There you go, tip it back. And then we say thank you for coming, Harry Ann. All right, Dunsky. So here we go, instant replay. One time, oh, cut you off again. All right, there we go. One time through the middle, downtown, and here we go. So I'm gonna check my chicken thighs while I get the rest of my mise en place together. Mise en place, very important term in the kitchen. Does anyone know what it means? Put in place. In other words, do your prep work. Get yourself set up for success, and then you can cook. Oh, right? What do we say? Brown food tastes good. <laughs> Right, there we go. So again, like a lot of times people also though, when they're not used to this kind of thing, they're like, oh my God, I've been cooking it for so long. It's high, I'm gonna burn. Like, and, and then you get nerviosa, right? So I have a little thing also, I have a million little things. But food is like a dog. It smells fear. If you are nervous and bunched up when, <laughs> if you are nervous and bunched up when you're cooking, guess what? Your food knows it and will react accordingly. So, put a smile on your face, do it with confidence. If you mess it up, whatever, it's a chicken thigh, it's only dinner, call for pizza. I mean, you know, take the ribbing that you're gonna get from your friends. But, <laughs> kidding, um, I mean, my friends would, yeah, anywho. Uh, so, they'll be brown on both sides. We're gonna take my chicken thighs out and, and go onions in there. So, oh, by the way, what are we making? <laughs> would you like to know, as a matter of fact? I forgot the headline. <laughs> oh my God, really? <laughs> so we're making braised chicken thighs with mushrooms and an almond puree. And what is special about this dish is, yes, we have braised chicken thighs like chicken. I'm like, uh, chicken. I could eat chicken every single night of the week. I love chicken. And really, honestly, great chicken is not that easy to do well. It's really easy to do bad chicken. But I like to do a good chicken. So, um, so that we're going to braise the chicken thighs with some mushrooms and some chicken stock and some wine. And then we finish this sauce with a roasted almond puree. And then what it does is it thickens the whole sauce and gives such a beautiful, unctuous mouthfeel. And you're like, what is that? 
Right, and like this will make you a rock star at your house, and like you can buy all this stuff in the grocery store. All right, so onions ready. Let's get a little garlic ready while this is happening. Not brown yet. Not brown yet. So, and the thing about braising, when I started, like I was starting to learn braising, I mean, it took me a long time to understand, like, all right, you have to go through all these steps. You cannot rush these steps because this is where you are developing the big flavor. If you rush any of these steps, if you go quickly on sweating your onions, if you don't brown your chicken enough, it will be pale, it will be soulless, and it will just be like, eh, all right, wow, you know what? I spent a lot of time getting that stuff already. It cooked for a long time, and then it wasn't even really that worth it. So what I'm saying, make sure you don't skimp on the beginning step. Once we get the liquid in there and the chicken thighs are in their jacuzzi, treat it like a stepchild. That's great. Like, you know, perfect. But don't skimp on the getting started phase. So, all right, garlic clove. How are you doing? All right, while I'm doing this, any questions? You guys have been very, very quiet. What do you got? Stand up and yell it out. Sorry, my chicken thighs are screaming at me. Can you just, like, I can't hear you. Does my grill or my oil ever get black? Well, that would be the part that if I see my pan getting away from me and the smoke and all that kind of stuff and it's starting to burn, turn your pan down. Now, there's also this. A lot of people will be like, do you use olive oil for that? What about the smoke point? What about that? You know what? I am an olive oil user. I am an extra virgin olive oil user, in fact. I mean, to me, there are no degrees of virginity. Yeah, are you not? A true story. So, I mean, it's like, I'm not asking. <laughs> so it's all, you're on the honor game here. <laughs> so, uh, but like extra virgin olive oil is what they make when they squeeze and they press the olives. It's what they make first. Everything else that they make, they either chemically treat it or cook what's left after they make extra virgin to extract more crap oil after that. Now, there are definitely degrees of quality of extra virgin olive oil, but like for this, like cooking like this, I mean, this is all I use. I never use, unless I'm doing something that I want a very neutrally flavored oil, then I would go like peanuts or uh, like grapeseed oil, something like that. But for the most part, no, I'm an olive oil girl. And I don't worry, it's also like for this, for the couple of minutes that we're doing this, and if I see my, so I've actually, you know what? This is like instinctual, I just saw this, and I turned my burner down to medium a little while ago. <laughs> but it's like, if you see your pan, like bad stuff happening and it's turning black, turn it down, that's all. And if it does get away from you, and sometimes it does, you know, it happens to all of us. So if you're doing this and the crud on the bottom of your pan turns black, start over. Not with new food, but a different pan. Like take the one that you have, either wash it or get a different pan. Don't ever try to build a braise on a burned crud, okay? The, the crud, the, the actual French technical term for it is fond. It means bottom, like, a, like the fond d'artichaut, like the bottom of an artichoke or the fond of something. The fawn is the crud on the bottom. We love that, it tastes great. That is brown food. That's the crud on the bottom of the pan. We love that. All right, look at, oh, brown food. So we're taking our chicken thighs out. We're gonna let them rest for a hot second. Now this oil in here, I'm gonna ditch. And we start over with a little teensy bit of fresh oil. We throw our onions in there. I love that sound. I love that sound, and I have to say, this smell, onions and olive oil, like, that's a chef facial. I mean, I put my face on, like, I'm really 150 years old, but it's like, <laughs> olive oil on there. So, we add our onions, all right, we add salt. Shall we talk salt now? Wait, hang on. Did I answer your question, lady over here? Like, sorry, did I answer your question? Okay. 
I started off with a light coating of olive oil, but remember our chicken thighs, the skin has a lot of fat in it. So that melts out. And so that's where that fat comes from. That's why it was like, look, you're like, oh my God, you started off with that. That came from the chicken itself. All right, good, there we go. All right, so let's talk salt. I'm just gonna jump out there and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, if you don't cook with salt, you will never be a good cook. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> own it, it's just the way it is. Now, you're like, but wait, but I'm like my, my heart, my cardiologist, my blood pressure, like, all right, back it on down. Um, if you cook from scratch, <laughs> fresh produce, fresh meat, like nothing processed, nothing frozen, nothing canned, from scratch, you can salt with reckless abandon and you don't get close to the sodium or salt, whatever that is, anything that is frozen, processed, canned, and especially fast food. Sorry. You know, it's a little bit different. I mean, and I get it where people are nervous and they're like, oh my God, wait, you just put all that salt in there? And I'm like, all right, that was like a half a teaspoon of salt. And you have to start from the beginning. But let's talk about like why we need to do this. Salt is a flavor enhancer. It just turns the volume up on flavor. It makes things taste more. So have you ever heard of anyone putting salt on watermelon or like on fruit or, and you're like, what are those freak shows just want salty watermelon? No, it makes it taste sweeter. Always when you're making a dessert, there's pinches of salt in desserts and that kind of stuff. So um, because it makes things taste more, it just turns the volume up. Now, and then people say, well, like why don't you cook with pepper? Pepper is a very different thing. It is a spice and it is a very strong spice and it brings another flavor to the party. This one, like, you know, this salt you can think of as like whatever you're cooking's like wingman. You know, that is like, that makes you look great. Like, wow, <laughs> you can stand next to me all the time, you know? I'm like, I'm looking good today. <laughs> yeah, thank you, salt. I'll go out with you anytime. Um, so, but that's what the point is. It makes things taste more. So does that mean that I'm saying like, oh, cool, Chef Ann says that you can just go and like salt with reckless abandon and that's fine? No, <laughs> that is absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm saying, how should food taste? Great. 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 <laughs> okay. All right, we'll hurry up. Uh, <laughs> um, wow. All right, you guys made me just forget what I was saying. Um, no, salt makes my, my wingman, makes me look great, uh, makes food taste more. Um, so you have to salt from the beginning. If you don't salt from the beginning, you can't get to the end of your dish and think that you're gonna throw in a couple sprinky dinks of salt and say, like, think it's gonna have the same effect. You have to start from the beginning with a wide flavor base. Like, cut yourself a wide swath. Develop flavors now. This is where your technique as a cook comes in. So, and then, taste your food. <laughs> taste your food. I, like, I mean, I ask people all the time when they're cooking on Worst Cooks, How's it taste? I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> like, you don't taste it very well. How do you know how does it taste? Like, what if something's going wrong? Like, taste your food while you're cooking, people. It's like if you made, like, if something went wrong or whatever. Like, and, and, and it happens, you know? Like, sugar for salt or something else or too much of something or not enough of something, whatever, that kind of stuff. That's the way you gotta roll. So, all right, we're sweating our onions. We add a little garlic in there. I mean, now this is like the double chef face, so this is like double happiness right here. Um, so we have salt, we have olive oil, we have our chicken thighs. We're gonna add our chicken thighs back. Oh, actually, we have some mushrooms that we're gonna do. Let's like cut up some mushrooms and get those going in there. And then we're gonna put our, our braise all together and then we're just gonna let it go. In the meantime, we're gonna have a little chit chat, you and me. Oh, you guys. But while that's happening, anything else happening? Yeah, what do you got? Well, I have special eyes. Um, no. <laughs> so the question, <laughs> the question was, why do the onions not my, make my eyes water when I'm cutting them? All right. So, I mean, what happens when you cut an onion? That there's acids in the the cells of the onion. When you cut them, you're breaking those cells and you're releasing those acids. So some onions are just more acidic when they get older. Like the the acids in the in the cells of the onions concentrate. And I, a lot of times, do cry a lot when I'm cutting onions. But the other thing is, 
If you cut an onion with a sharp knife in the way that I just uh, demonstrated for you, it cuts like you do it quick. You cut through the cells and you move on. So you're releasing less of those acids and those acids go in your food and that's where we want them to be. Like that's the flavor of the onions. So we're cutting our onions. I, we're cooking our onions. We sweated them low and slow. So you think about sweating. What do you do when you sweat? You get hot, you let off water, and you start to smell. That's a good thing. We are developing big, <laughs> true story. I mean, it's a true story. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's where we are developing flavor. So I put those onions right on top of the crud, the brown crud that came from my chicken. So all of that flavor is staying right in my pan. It's like a one pan dinner. So I'm throwing my mushrooms in there. Hello, beautifuls. So mushrooms, like, the, you know, what you want to use at your grocery store. You can spend a lot of money on mushrooms, or if you're making dinner on a Tuesday, buy grocery store mushrooms, you know, buy cremini, buy shiitake, buy uh, oyster mushrooms. Pick your battles, people. You know, it's also the thing about cooking, and it's like people, don't get so bunched up over it. <laughs> Relax. Relax. Like, don't take yourself or dinner so seriously. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the process of creating. And if, if you're going to say, like, that's too much money, Ugh, I'm not going to make this recipe, well, like, let's figure out a way around it. Or, you know, like, I'm not going to do this because, uh, I, you know, mushrooms are too expensive. We'll find a cheaper mushroom. Or I'm not going to make that recipe because it says to cook the beans from scratch and soak them open. Uh, I'm not going to do that. We'll use a can of beans then. You know, like, pick your battles and do what feels good for you. Oh, hi, Ming Tsai. How are you? So, um, I heard you're looking for a good-looking salt wingman. A salt wingman? No, I will say I, this. I do only soy sauce, but. I, I'm Sally. Salt. Can I have some champagne? Your pepe, Where's your, your bubbles? Pepper. Is it bubbles? Yeah, it, of course. Have you met me? Am I interrupting? No. Oh. Here you go, babe. Can you guys give it up to Amber L? How good is she? I'm just here to try your food. Glass. No, I need my own glass. Uh, ask that guy. Oh, keep going. Keep going. I am continuing. Yeah, you're a hot mess, girl. Let me I help am, you out, Do man. I look like a drowned rat? Oh, wow. There we go. Oh, there we go. Hang on, hang on. Come here. Jesus. Do I look like a terrible mess? Oh. No, you look awesome. Look at I, I like it when she's like this. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this on? <laughs> shit. By the Hi, way, you can say shit. I'm you don't have to say shit. And this is Ming Tsai, and we're inappropriate. <laughs> and my glass is bigger. Well, <laughs> we certainly hope so. Mine's more effective. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Are there any children in here? Thank no, God. No, uh, just this one. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're adding our mushrooms on top of this. Basically, you guys, we're coming to the end of our building stage to this. You just hang on one quick I second. Swing. I'm going to right. food. And notice, you guys, I am salting every, a little sprinky dink of salt every step of the way. Wildly important. I am a kosher salt kind of girl. Ming uses soy sauce. But think about what they do. They are same flavor profiles. They do, they, they, it's like, you know, in, in this play, Anne Burrell is uh, being the role of kosher salt today. In this play, in this opera over here, Ming Tsai is playing the role of soy sauce. But they're both the lead character, the supporting roles to whatever it is you're doing. They, like, they have the same functions. And that's what I saw, like, what I love so much about cooking. There are a million ways to do the same thing or to get to a great end, but it is every chef has worked their way out that what works best for them. So it's like what I offer to you um, when I'm teaching you my recipes or demonstrating my recipes, like these are things that I have spent time, internalized, worked out, you know, spent years thinking about, and they are the best way for me. And Ming has done that same thing for him. So what we offer to you guys are our professional opinions, but opinions nonetheless. You can hate them. You can tell us to, you know, whatever, go pound salt or go make soy sauce. <laughs> but that's what it is, your opinions. And then what you do, remember, you are the chef of your own kitchen. So whatever works there well for you, fantastic. The recipe police are not going to be right over. I mean... If you like it, great. Maybe not everyone else does, but it's your dinner. What do you got? Uh, let's see free, what I have here. Something free cheap, wine. Cheap, <laughs> free, free wine and something that's cheap and cheerful. Don't cook with expensive wine. 
but also don't cook with crap wine. I mean, like have it be something that you would conceivably drink. <laughs> it might not be your first choice, but don't spend a lot of money on wine that you're gonna cook with. If you have wine, like, you know, expensive wine that's left over, I can't ever, that would have never happened in a million years in my house, but <laughs> if you have exp expensive wine that's like left over and you have it, it's open for a couple of days, yes, cook with that. But don't go buy an expensive bottle of wine because you're making risotto al barolo, you know, and it says, oh, buy barolo, and barolo's like 50 bucks a bottle. No. You know, like, ask but, your... But you still call it that on your menu. Of course! <laughs> Duh. <laughs> but, so go to your wine store, ask your wine monger, ask your wine salesman, like, this is what I'm making, these are, like, what the dish is, and they will point you in the direction of something reasonably priced to cook with. Pick your battles, people. Oh, that's bullshit. Right? All right, let's go, guys. Yeah! Yeah! Whoa! Whoa! Uh, there you go. So. I, I roofied everyone for you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Have some more water. Good to know. <laughs> Good to know. By all right. A comment on taste. Yes. When we cook for you all, not everything's going to taste good. That's okay, because not everyone has taste. <laughs> Just telling it like it is. Wow. Point being is we think some taste good. You may not. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I know that shit tastes good. You taste good. MSG. <laughs> Main why do I, super grand. Why, why do my fingers feel fat? <laughs> All right. Wait. <laughs> Who is got I'm never <laughs> washing my arm. I'm not ready to run to that anymore. Jar Jar Bing. <laughs> All right. I love it when things get silly like this. Um, okay. See, look at the joy I have. How good is my dish going to taste? Uh, right? Doesn't matter. It... Oh, my God. All right. Any questions for me or Ming about anything? Like, is it all fair game? What do you got? Stand up and yell it out, babe. Chicken stock. So this is the jacuzzi. So what we do is, so oh, we've developed big flavors. I browned my chicken, I sweated my onions, so salted them, added a little garlic, added my mushrooms. Got that going, a little drink of wine. Does that make everyone happier? Yes. We cooked the wine till it went away. We snuggled our thunder thighs right back in there. And then we added the chicken stock. So what we do now, BTB, RTS. BTB, RTS, bring to boil, reduce to simmer. So we BTB, we bring it up to temperature, and then we take it down, and then we relax. Great, that's it. And so then now our, my chicken thighs are doing the same thing. They're like, I like it here. So there we go. So we're gonna walk away from it for a minute. You're like, look at, we have time to drink wine. Toast. All right, what do you got, what do you got? You have elk and venison in your house, or? <laughs> Wait, you have dead elk and venison in your house? <laughs> in your bedroom? What? <laughs> but it was raised in so we have no Yes. Now, the thing about when you're talking about, and especially like wild game and stuff like that, because you think about like those animals have really been on getting all those muscles, have been getting a lot of use. So when a muscle gets a lot of use, brrr, welcome to the gun show, that is what you're trying to do. You're trying to make them nice and hard. So why we are even interested in cooking meat like this is because the more use a muscle gets, the tougher it's going to be. But when you cook it like this, low and slow, the more flavorful it is. So gamey meat like that, I would recommend. So the more like use a muscle gets, like stuff that you've gone to hunt for, tends to be very gamey due to the use that they've gotten in their diet. So I would recommend take that, marinate it overnight in red wine with like some uh, onion, celery, garlic, that kind of stuff. You know, spice, like some herbs, like thyme, maybe juniper berries, bay, that kind of stuff. Some do milk, if not red wine, if you don't want wine. So it, what it does is kind of alleviates a bit of the gaminess. It also starts to the acids in the wine or the milk start to tenderize things. It sort of I mean, it's not, they're not gonna make it like, you know, it really tender, but it starts to break down the tissues that are, that are, and it gives you a leg up on your braising. But when things like that, so when you're starting off, brown your meat, 
I would recommend then giving it a booster of like pancetta, bacon, something like that. Put that in your pan and then the onions on top of it. Give it a little help. You know, you get by with a little help from your friends. And bacon, <laughs> bacon's always my friend. <laughs> All right. What else? What do you got? Uh, it's a, it's a braise, braise it a lot. They're tougher meats, you have to braise them. Yes, but that's, again, low and slow in liquid. And that's like something you would probably, you know, depending on the size of the pieces of meat. So like, if you're gonna do like a venison stew or a venison ragu for pasta or something like that, like considering, or like, uh, you know, it or depends shank. on what you're, yeah, it's like, but they shank. don't have a good shank to no, it. They don't. But like, think so about the cut of meat and the size of what it is you are cooking, what the purposes is, and then taste it. So, braised meats, like the sign of a lot of times people say, oh, braised meat, it should just fall apart. No, it shouldn't. That's overcooked. Braised meat should hold its shape, but you should be able to use a fork. You should not have to need a, a knife to cut it, but you should be able to do it with your fork, but it should hold its shape. Absolutely. If it doesn't, if it just falls out apart, it's over braised. But by the, the other cooking technique for that is don't cook it. Because sashimi or raw tenderloin, elk tenderloin, uh, reindeer tenderloin, just cut up raw is delicious. So it's things so like that. So under 30 seconds or over 30 minutes. Right, exactly. It's either super quick or super long, but nothing in the middle. What do you got? Can you talk about braising versus braising? Yes. So braising, when you're talking about braising, I mean, first of all, it's the, the getting started is the same and all that kind of stuff. So, but the difference between braising and stewing, I mean, it's, it's kind of like the difference between roasting and baking. There is none, but, <laughs> but technically what the difference is, braised things are larger things and stews are bite-sized things. Um, and so when you're putting your liquid in though, in the beginning, uh, when you're starting this, it is about add liquid to about a half to two thirds of the way up the sides of the protein that you are cooking. Let it BTB, RTS, bring to boil, reduce to simmer. Let it reduce, add more liquid. It is the dance. Add liquid and reduce, add liquid and reduce. Because if you just add all the liquid from the beginning and say like, ah, well, there, I'm gonna save some time and not have, it doesn't work that way. Because you'll just be boiling the crap out of whatever it is you're cooking and you will get zero flavor and it will never get tender and have no soul. So it's really about, um, the, the technical difference is the size of the pieces of protein, but the cooking technique is the same. Low and slow in liquid, and it's add liquid and reduce, add liquid and reduce, and taste it while you're doing it because it is so amazing. The life cycle of a braise that you have, the differences from where you start to where you finish, and yes, they all taste amazing, but what you go from here to over here, wildly different. And you're like, Rrr. I mean, it's like, I like to say it's like a fine wine, or like me, I just better with age. <laughs> All right, so we've got this working. I have my aromatics in there. I have a bay leaf, I have a thyme bundle. I don't have time for thyme. So what do I do? I just tie it up, and it's kind of self-picking then. The little leaves just flutter off, and then I can take this out. Thank you for coming, so. There we go, it's like we make it all for a party. So while this is happening, beautifulness, I've got my super secret flavor weapon over here. Uh, almonds that have been toasted, blanched almonds, toasted. You put them in a little bit of a food processor. I mean, like a teensy food processor. All right. Every time I do want to demo somewhere or something, I'm like, I really do know how to cook and use this stuff, but it's every new, it's new, I don't know how to, okay. Hopefully one day Can I'll I help? help? Do you know? Yes, please, can you do this? Oh, hi, Al. Oh, KitchenAid oh, man. We brought out, right, we brought out yeah, the technical, there we go. She's like the Sears Thank man. Thank you. But younger and fitter. Oh, see, look, it's Oh, no. Okay, KitchenAid intern. All right. <laughs> you don't carry a gun, do you? <laughs> All right. So we're just, thank you, Mr. KitchenAid man. So we're just gonna puree these with a little bit of salt and olive oil till it becomes like a lovely sort of like, more than a paste, like, thank you Dolphin. Uh, more than a paste, we're just gonna let it keep going like this and then we add it to finish our sauce at the end. 
And what it does, adding a nut puree, is like adding a thickener, like a starch thickener to a sauce. But the mouthfeel and the unctuousness and the, like, the almost like umami that you get from this is spectacular. This is what takes this dish from a yeah, braised chicken thighs to that's not just a Tuesday dinner. Or, yeah, that's a special Tuesday. <laughs> right, there we go. Um, <laughs> what? I keep feeling like you're going like, to have something been, to say. You've been there. Well, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Oh, good luck. <laughs> um, all right, questions, questions, what do we got? We're coming to an end, guys, like, let's get it in together. You guys have been very tame and a little bit unruly, and I have to, I'm not unruly. I have to say, I'm a little hair disappointed. But no, don't worry, you can what say. What started my love of cooking? What started my love of cooking? Um, well, I mean, I always cooked as a kid. My mom was a great cook, um, very creative, uh, but my mom, <laughs> My mom was the kind of person that would make just enough. <laughs> so you'd be like, mmm, that was so good, can I have more? Nope, it's all gone. <laughs> and then my mom would say, don't eat just because it tastes good. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, why else do we eat? <laughs> so, but to me, I always loved cooking because it was like an arts and crafts project with something to eat at the end. And when I was three, I went to my mom and I said, mom, I have a friend named Julie. She said, you do? Who? And I was like, Julie Child. I watch her every day on TV. So my mom swears that Julia, because of Julia, when I was three, I became a cook. It was really, I mean, like if you ask me, it was when I was 23 that I decided to do it. But always so much. I love the creating. I love the cooking part of it. I love the hospitality part of it. I love the, the joy that I feel for providing for other people. Well, we love you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, what do you got? Really? Security, we got a guy in a baseball cap. Really? We got to get him out of here. Really? Thank you very much. C4. Anybody who tells me to put a lid on it, you might as, you might as well just tell me to calm down. Because if you, if you want to see me do anything but. No. no um, so the point of this, why this, and I think that's a very good question. Why I don't put a lid on this is because I want it to reduce. I want to do that dance of the, to have it reduce. If I put a lid on it, then my liquid won't reduce and it just becomes like sort of a steam room, an incubator, rather than evaporating, so then I get to add more. Think about it when we talk about, when, what are we doing when we are reducing? You're what? Concentrating, Concentrating the flavor, but why? That's the result of reducing. But what are you doing? You're cooking the water out of this. What stays in the pan? The flavor. So ergo, the flavor is concentrated by reducing. We are reducing the volume of what we have, which concentrates the flavor. All right, so we reduce, and then we add more, and we reduce, and we add more. So it's like a tease. We're having like a game here. All right, but yeah. What? You can, you can make, like, all this yesterday, like, two days ago. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and don't, it's probably don't, better tomorrow. Okay, this is so important. Don't do the rookie move. If you make a huge braise and you're serving the next day, never separate the protein from your liquid. Let them chill together. If you separate them, that meat's going to get tough on you, and then the whole dance that she just did is wasted. So chill don't it in the braise. Don't make me waste a dance. Chill it in the braise. <laughs> all right, what do you got? Well, it depends on, right, is this a sponsor? Yes. <laughs> what does this say? Yes. Um, I don't have my glasses on. Um, no. <laughs> um. <laughs> Here, we'll just, okay, so, <laughs> right, um, right, uh, <laughs> We just want to come back next year. Um, all right. Brands of olive oil are hard to say. So I will say this. For my, like, cooking needs, like for starting a pan and for everything that I saute or everything, like, that kind of stuff, I would buy, like, Colavita or Filippo Berrio. They are, you know, like you can get them at Costco. You can get them at the grocery store. They are fine enough for this.
and they're ex you know, extra virgin always, of course. The difference in where, what, where the difference lies in olive oil is how they're produced, how they're harvested, and then how they are pressed. And why we make such a big difference is that the ones that are, um, you know, you go on vacation to Italy and you spend $30 for a liter of olive oil and you don't cook with that. I mean, you can, it's great, but adding heat to olive oil changes the flavor. So what you want with those kind of oils, you feel the green grassy and it depends on where they're from. You know, like different parts of Italy, they're like the olive oils taste very differently. You get them from Greece, you get them from Spain, they're very, very different. And so you think about, for your finishing oils, these are where you use those big fat olive oils. So taste them, play with them, experience them. Like, you know, you have lighter, fruitier ones that are from Liguria, which is the Italian Riviera. Um, and it's like those olive trees have been caressed by the Mediterranean breezes, <laughs> you know, looking at the yachts like in Portofino right there. I mean, <laughs> those are some pretty happy, fruity olives. I mean, you go to Tuscany, like up in the hills where they're all out hunting for the chingale, you know, like, they have a little bit of a harder life. So it's like, uh, uh, you know, like a little more peppery, give you a kick in the back of the throat. But you think about what is it that you're using it for? Then that's when you apply that olive oil. Med? <laughs> Hi, I see you. Uh, you know, I used to only be a stovetop razor, uh, but then for space reasons, a lot of times I would be an oven brazer. No. Chicken thighs, I would always pretty much do, unless I'm doing like in a restaurant, I have like, you know, a, some hotel, like big, huge trays of them. Oven. Cover that, that would be cover with foil, and then the last 20 minutes of cooking, take the foil off, and, and there you go. But no, oven and stovetop raising, no, no, no. no but difference. this smells better. This is better for Instagramming, and your kids <laughs> appreciate that smell throughout the house. Right. All right. So uh, we're going to come down the home stretch with this. Like, now, can you just get a shot of this liquid, please? This li no, come closer, my friend. Can you see my liquid? <laughs> so are we almost done? Are we out of time? Are we out of time? That's my fault. Yeah. Yeah. All right, whatever. Well, I'll be done when I'm Just done. do another hour, then we don't have to come back next year. Uh, bye, do thank another, you. No, have to do another. <laughs> they would um, like to see you do another dish. All right, wait, no, we're just going to finish this up quickly. But let's just talk about, like, look at that liquid. That liquid is brown. And also, a lot of times, I will be a, instead of using stock to braise, I would use water to braise. Like, if I'm doing lamb shanks or short ribs and stuff, I will use water. Why? Because I always have it. And if I have done a good enough job getting my, my uh, braise started and all of the brown food happening, then you don't need stock. Like water does just fine. This is a chicken stock because it's readily available. Chicken thighs, it makes sense. You know what I mean? Or it's a lot of times, sometimes I would use chicken stock to, to braise beef and stuff in, but water just as fine as long as you do a great uh, development phase. So, all right, so I've got my almond puree. Hang on, just one quick second. Oh my God, this is gonna be the bane of my existence. All right, one more time here. Oh my God, like really? <laughs> Mr. KitchenAid man. <laughs> oh, that was my shot. <laughs> all right, so here we go. Look at our chicken thighs beautifully cooked. Oh wait, hang on, I have raw chicken on it. <laughs> I need a new plate, please. Thank you. Yes, puree me up. Thank you. All right, chicken thighs out. So, I tasted my sauce to know where I am for salt. What do you think, Ming? It's delicious. And the thyme adds like such a lovely, fresh flavor to it. Thank you. All right, so now we just add a little bit of this puree in here and like it thick, watch me. Thickens, <laughs> thickens the sauce beautifully and it adds such an amazing depth of flavor and mouthfeel. So there we go, all in there. We BTB, we let it come together, and then we spoon it over, and we garnish with a little chive it. So we're coming up at the end, guys, uh, just waiting for my sauce to reduce and thicken. So any last quick like questions, or what do you got? All right, yes. I always like, a li I use crushed red pepper, which is like chili, chili de arable that's like, you know, crunched up. Um, 
I like a little teensy spicy kick in everything, but a little teensy spicy kick. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a big spicy kind of girl. I like when spice adds to the flavor and brings a life to the party, but doesn't take over the party. All right, what do you got? So I, uh, I did not submerge the chicken skin all the way in the liquid. So, or I would turn it over and make sure though that the skin on top is coming up. And then if you really want to give a good quick like flash to make it nice and super crisp right, right before you send it out, you can put it on the broiler for a sec. Yeah, because no one likes a flabby flaccid chicken skin. <laughs> no, nobody likes that. It's a bad mouthfeel. Um, but make sure, though, that you get it really nice and crispy. Don't skimp on the initial. What? No, That's no. mine. That's yours. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Sauce <laughs> coming down the home stretch. Anyone have a cigarette? <laughs> All right. So here we go. <laughs> like, really? Like, we don't have plating yeah. spoons yeah, around yeah, yeah. here? All right. <laughs> really? <laughs> We're not going to say anything, sir. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> you know, if I was a superhero, my nickname, my name would be the Emasculator. <laughs> I don't mean to do it. It just happens. It just happens. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> All right, so there we go. I don't even know what's happening anymore. <laughs> All right, and then we just finish this quickly. <laughs> this is the happiest chicken thigh I've ever made. <laughs> All right, there we go. Thank you guys so very much. <laughs> Thank you.